Robert Gale, thank you for joining me. You treated many of the people injured or made sick by the Chernobyl explosion in 1986. How did that happen, that you became involved? Well, um, I was invited by Mr. Gorbachev um, to come to Moscow just after the accident and bring with me some, uh, you know, more sophisticated technologies that were not readily available in the Soviet Union at that time. And how many people did you and your team treat? Well, slightly more than 200. And that would include, uh, of obviously, the most, uh, the most affected by the disaster? Well, these were the uh, actually 204 people that we felt had something called acute radiation syndrome. Well, fast forward to now, before I go back to what you saw, we have HBO having a hit TV series, uh, Chernobyl, it's called, a slightly fictionalised account of this disaster, that, well, the effects of which you witnessed uh, firsthand. And we're shown horrible wounds, uh, a baby dying from contamination, apparently from the father, and it ends with claims that between 4,000 and 93,000 people died as a consequence. From what you've seen, how much of that HBO series corresponds with what you saw at the time and know subsequently? Right. Well, um, you know, let me say just on the onset that I think it's, uh, you know, a very, very well done bit of television. But um, there, there are a number of technical errors that uh, I understand screenwriters need to make, but to keep people glued in every week. But uh, the examples you cite, I mean, we have, for example, we, we know there are about 31 deaths from the accident, not, not thousands. Um, I've written on, in some editorials about why this, uh, you know, it's very sad that this child died, but uh, I think there's, it's impossible that it was related to the mother's exposure to radiation. Um, and so there are just a number of, of factual errors that uh, it's important to point out because, you know, uh, physicians or, or people will, will not understand and may make serious errors. For example, the ignorance of people about the effects of radiation, you know, we estimate led to about one million unnecessary abortions in the Soviet Union and in Europe. Physicians and, and other people told women, well, you might have been exposed to radiation, you need to have an abortion. But we know from the atomic bomb survivors exactly what doses of radiation, uh, you know, cause fetal abnormalities, and no one outside of the nuclear power station could have received such a dose. Robert Gale, one thing, uh, I did a, a story recently, again, and I've written about this sort of thing more than once, um, that the effects of the scaremongering over Chernobyl were more deadly than the disaster itself. And a lot of people seem very angry to hear the truth about that, but uh, let me just go through it with you bit by bit. Now, as you said, about 31 first responders, people on the scene at the time, died in the blast or shortly afterwards. First of all, what killed them exactly? Was it radiation alone? Uh, was it the effects of the blast as well? Sure. Well, I mean, in these kinds of accidents, um, with rare exception, you know, we deal with compound injuries. So these are firefighters. They're, they're putting out a fire, uh, you know, uh, fire that could be a thousand degrees Celsius, and they are exposed to chemicals, of course, and burning graphite and radiation, and and all of these things happen to the same individuals. The the people closest to the fire get burns. They also get the highest radiation dose. So um, it, it's almost impossible for us to single out exactly the cause. I mean, I would say that. We had about 13 individuals where I would pin the blame on radiation. And the rest of the deaths are hard to, to pick out the radiation versus these concomitant injuries. Then after the blast, of course, over the years, there is 
well, we've seen other health effects, but really they've been narrowed down to thyroid cancer in children at the time. Uh, that seems to be the only known long-term health effect. Uh, how many children do you think died and, and how serious is thyroid cancer? Can it be treated, for instance? Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are between six and 7,000 cases of thyroid cancer that, that we can confirm. Um, you know, fortunately, it's a, um, a very treatable cancer. And so um, I estimate that there are less than 10 or 15 deaths. So that's tragic, of course, but, but um, it, it's not what many people have, have imagined. But with regard to other cancers, um, you know, we're in a very uh, dicey situation because we have other things moving, many moving parts. For example, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and uh, amongst these liquidators, for example, we, know, we have very good evidence that these people increased their alcohol consumption and increased their tobacco consumption. And those changes in their habits um, are much more powerful in causing cancer and other health you know, defects than, they, than is the radiation from Chernobyl. So it's, it's, it's somewhere between very, very difficult and impossible for us to really know whether any of these, if, whether there are any increase in other cancers. We probably will never really be certain about that. But you must find it extraordinary, as someone who actually knows the science of these things, actually treated the patients, to have seen some of the amazing scaremongering about Chernobyl since. I mean, just in Australia, I don't know about America, but in Australia we've seen people like uh, our former health uh, environment minister, Peter Garrett, say 30,000 people died. And we've seen the Australian Conservation Foundation say 250,000 people died. And you no doubt know the work of Helen Caldicott. Uh, she says a million people died. How do these amazing exaggerations get said and worse believed, do you think? Well, uh, you know, people have a very um, extraordinary fear of radiation. And I think, we, you know, we've studied this. Why is that? Well, you know, most risks to our lives, so you take a fire or a flood, um, falling off a cliff, they are something that, that a human can perceive. Radiation is something which they can't perceive. So, I mean, you and I could be being radiated with a lethal dose as we're speaking. And I think it's this uh, fear of the unknown that allows people's imaginations to go wild. You know, in fact, um, if you think about it, these kind of green parties and um, anti-nuclear people, well, you know, they should be strongly nuclear. I mean, for example, if we calculate the danger to produce electricity for a terawatt of electricity, well, nuclear is about, you know, 10 or 100 times safer. And one other thing that I'd like to point out is that when you burn coal, you release radioactive substances into the atmosphere because coal comes from the earth, coal contains plutonium and thorium. So for every terawatt of electricity we produce, we release more radiation from coal than we do from nuclear. Now, you know, it's a complex technology and it has to be handled carefully. You know, a Ferrari is a beautiful racing machine, but you wouldn't put a six-year-old in a driver's seat. Then it becomes a death weapon. So um, I'm always surprised that Greens are anti rather than strongly pro, because if we want to stop global warming in the next few decades, nuclear is the only avenue. That seems to be the case. It seems also that many of the projections about future deaths were based on mathematical modelling that in turn was based on the supposition that there was no safe dose of radiation, that the slightest bit of radiation had to have a negative impact on people's health. Is that uh, no safe dose theory? Does that still hold up? Well, you know, uh, I have to answer you in two different, wearing two different hats. Um, 
you know, in one regard, as a person who's concerned with, you know, the safety of the public, our safest assumption is that there is no safe dose or that any dose of radiation can cause harm. So, for example, a physician should never order a radiological procedure unless there's a perceived benefit. But, you know, looking at it another way, all of our assumptions are based on a very limited data set, mostly the atomic bomb survivors. So the atomic bomb survivors got very high doses of uh, ionizing radiations in an instant. And now we're trying to apply that model to a group of people, hundreds of thousands of people, who are exposed to radiation over years. So, um, you know, we have to make a lot of worst case assumptions about what might happen. But I would just point out that there are people in Australia who get 10 times higher dose from natural radiation than people who live in Melbourne or Sydney. These are people who live, you know, in areas where there's a lot of radiation in the soil. And we don't really see a difference in cancer rates based on where people live, even though these people get 10 times more. So, uh, yeah, we have to be careful with radiation. But um, so far, we haven't seen any convincing increase in leukemia, for example, which was the most increased cancer after the A-bombs. Uh, that occurred about 10 years after the uh, 1945. Now, we're more than 30 years after Chernobyl, and we haven't seen any convincing increase in leukemia. And that suggests that a huge wave of cancers caused by the radiation from Chernobyl is very, very unlikely to occur. Robert Gales, fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much indeed for your time. Well, thank you.